Well, hi there. Uh, I'm Cory Doctorow, and thanks to Jonathan for giving me the chance to speak in this video series. It's been amazing. I, I've watched all the other videos in the series, and they've blown me away. I hope I've got something useful to add here. Um, I'm going to try to pull together uh, a bunch of, excuse me, a bunch of different ideas that I think uh, tie together a lot of the themes that you've already heard about. Uh, I'm going to talk about how uh, the question of privacy and education is intimately tied up with questions of neoliberalism and justice and corruption and uh, copyright and the freedom of expression. I'm going to try and explain to you how neoliberalism makes our schools into factories, how it makes privacy in schools into something that we can't have, and um, how privacy interacts with copyright. So let's start with schools as a factory. So um, schools used to be in the business of something uh, intrinsically non-market. We used to say that um, education was not something that markets were very good at delivering because um, education wasn't a product. It was really a process and it was highly individuated. Uh, but under neoliberal doctrine, we've decided that schools need to be held accountable. And when we say that they need to be held accountable, we mean that they need to be held accountable in the way that businesses are. We need to measure the inputs going in and the outputs coming out. But the only outputs that we can readily measure of schools are outputs that are only glancingly related to education. For example, we can measure standardized test scores and we can measure um, ed, uh, uh, attendance. And it's true that both of those have some nexus with learning, but it's also really easy to see how if you reify standardized test scores above learning or attendance above learning, that you can easily uncouple them, right? So you might say, oh, well, an educational opportunity that a kid has outside of the school can't be taken advantage of because that would undermine her attendance. Or you might say that a genuine educational moment, like a kid walking into a classroom, and like I did when I was seven, I walked into my classroom, I picked up a book off the shelf, and I started reading it, and the teacher saw me, and she saw me connecting with a book. She recognized how important and special uh, that moment was, and she didn't interrupt it. She, she basically just left me alone. And for the next two days, I lay on the carpet behind the cubby holes and read that book. And it sparked my lifelong love affair with learning and with reading because the teacher got out of my way. What an important skill to have in education, to get out of your student's way. But when a school is a factory that produces educated children, that we measure through standardized test scores, and that we, um, measure, and that we measure through attendance scores, then when a kid comes in and does this, you have to say, I'm sorry, as much as you are totally engrossed by this learning opportunity, because it comes out of order, because it doesn't correspond to when I need you to be prepared to pass a standardized test on which my salary and the school's budget depends, you must stop learning and start participating in learning related activities that I have designed for you, regardless of its, its personal need for you. And schools are really badly suited to be treated as factories whose product is educated children and whose laborers are teachers and whose management is the administration, and whose shareholders are the public and whose board of directors is, you know, Ofsted or the government. Um, and when we treat them like that, we get these paradoxical outcomes. Now, um, one of the things uh, that this kind of um, mistrust of teachers and this idea that uh, a teacher's relationship with a student should be uh, uh, can't be uh, used to effectively regulate the student's behavior. It needs to be machine regulated and it needs to, uh, um, and, and students need to be prevented from getting up to mischief by automated systems, not by being taught good norms and protocols and by being overseen by teachers who knows how far they can go, is that we've implemented censorship in all of our schools, notionally to stop kids from looking at naked pictures and other sort of mind searing badness. And the internet is full of mind searing badness. I'm like totally the first one to say that there's plenty of stuff on the internet that my kids shouldn't be looking at. But there is no comprehensive list of all the bad stuff on the internet. And all the attempts to make one have been a fool's errand. On the one hand, that room full of prudes or that programmer thinking up regular expressions to find all the naughty words that will help her block all of the bad web pages, um, inevitably misses stuff and overblocks. And on an internet with a trillion pages, you're going to miss some stuff, right? You know, if there's, if there's 50 billion pages and you get it wrong 1% of the time and 10% of that is porn, 
Well, that's 5 billion pages that are porn, and 1% of 5 billion is, let's see, 500 million, 50 million pornographic pages that you're going to miss. Likewise, if there's 50 billion pages on the internet and you misclassify 1% of them as porn, well, that's 5 billion pages you're going to miss. That is so many Bodleian libraries or libraries of Congress that we're going to either over or under block. That's not even funny. I mean, ultimately, the only thing you can do with kids is teach them what to do when they see stuff that isn't stuff that they should be seeing. Because they'll see stuff they shouldn't see in the real world, too. And not that there's much distinction between the real world and the virtual. But they'll see stuff they shouldn't be seeing out there in the real world. And you need to have a trust relationship where when they see it, they are mature enough to look away, to stop looking, to go somewhere else, to find an adult and to talk about it with that adult. And that's ultimately the only practical way you can do it. Sure, it's hard, right? But at least it, it's not uh, laughable. At least it doesn't completely fail to have any chance of getting the job done. Meanwhile, we have censorware, and the censorware sits there silently blocking web pages. But you can't block a web page without spying on people's web traffic, on their internet traffic. Um, there is no way to make sure you're not visiting www.badsite.com without grabbing all of the clicks that you make and checking to see which ones are for www.badsite.com. And so censorship is surveillance, right? All censorship is surveillance. And the companies that do the surveillance, well, there's not enough schools for them to get really properly rich off of. So they do most of their business with governments. And I don't mean like some ministry that's stopping uh, junior civil servants from looking at porn. I mean autocratic governments in the Middle East and in the former Soviet Union who buy this stuff at mass scale and use it to try and control the flow of information in their countries to stop people from gaining information that threatens the social stability in which they get to govern autocratically. And so we are effectively shoveling our children's most private and intimate secrets into the hands of war criminals. And it's a disaster. But what's worse is what it does to privacy education. Because schools have already a terrible time teaching privacy education. It's a hard subject to teach. Um, you know, in my daughter's school, she goes to a state school here in Hackney. In year two in her ICT curriculum, their privacy advice was don't give any personal information to anyone on the internet and never talk to anyone you meet on the internet, period. Full stop. And that's, of course, incredibly dumb advice because, first of all, most of the people who present a danger to my child, uh, statistically, are people she knows, right? It's me and my family and my wife's family and the people who work in the school. Those are the people who present a clear and present danger to our children, statistically, the people most likely to pre pre present a danger to them, not strangers in Macs uh, patrolling the internet for, for little kids to, uh, to pick up. So that's, that's part one, is that it completely fails to actually stop them from getting into mischief. But the other thing is that it doesn't allow them to learn the really important things about how to be private, like how do you find out who's spying on your internet connection? Whose censoring proxy are you behind? What kind of company are they? Who's paying them? How much money do they pay them? What are their practices for data retention and handling? All of that stuff is stuff that they're not only not encouraged to figure out, but in fact they're in many ways prohibited from finding out. If your child takes any self-help measures to prevent people from spying on, the, on her while she's at school, she'll actually get exp expel expelled, excluded, or suspended for interfering with the school's ability to spy on her, to stop her from looking at naughty pictures on the internet and failing at doing that. So this uh, industrialized, neoliberal, market-oriented approach to education not only fails to educate kids, but puts them in a place where we can't teach them about privacy and where we actually have to take their privacy away. Now, what's the intersection of uh, copyright and privacy? Uh, that's one where historically, people who cared about internet issues and free speech kind of split into two camps. There were the privacy people and the copyright liberalization people. And the copyright liberalization people talked about openness and they talked about um, uh, being able to look at source code, and they talked about being able to share things freely. And then the people over on the privacy side talked about having control over your data and the state not spying on you and what war warrantless searches looked like and mass surveillance looked like. And they really seemed like they were in two camps. In fact, sometimes they seemed like they were in opposite camps because the open people wanted to be open. They wanted to share all their information. And the privacy people were always saying, don't share your information. 
But a funny thing happened on the way to the future. These two things have converged. They've become the same thing. Because the copyright wars have uh, taken as part of their mission to enable business models where how you use information is limited. Um, at first, it was the idea was that you were limited in not being able to share information. So if you bought a DVD, you couldn't make a copy of it easily for someone else. And then increasingly, it's been about stopping you from using that information without having to pay for that second use. So Netflix will let you stream a video, but it won't let you buy the video. You don't get to download it and save it. But of course, when Netflix sends you a video, it goes to your computer, right? That, vi that file is downloaded to your computer. The only way to stop you from saving it is to make sure that you're not allowed to know how your browser works, because otherwise you could install a Save As button in your browser. And indeed, that's what the law does. They make, make it a crime to tell people how their browsers work, where you give them information that helps them hack in their own Save As button to defeat the Netflix use control. Well, the problem with that is that um, if you're not allowed to know how your computer works, then you can never find out if your computer is spying on you. And so where we've seen things like um, uh, browser plugins that attack users, they often use bugs that are latent in the browser, uh, you know, and they can attack users in lots of terrible ways, like hijacking the camera and the microphone, getting access to your files and so on. There's a whole practice of something called sextortion or ratting, where uh, mostly young men uh, use malicious software that exploits browser bugs to um, spy on people through their webcams and take naked pictures of them and then extort them into performing sex acts on camera on the threat of having their naked pictures posted to their social media accounts because the remote access Trojans also let you harvest the passwords for those accounts. So um, the privacy stuff has sort of converged because it's not just creeps and voyeurs and criminals who like to use these bugs and weaponize them to attack you. The Snowden leaks have showed us that the lawful interception crowd, the, the spies, are also using browser bugs to exploit people uh, on the internet, to, to uh, go after the people they don't like. And in fact, this has produced this uh, really perverse situation where governments discover bugs that put the people whose security they're charged with protecting at risk and rather than patching those bugs, they do everything they can to keep them unpatched because they want to weaponize them. They want to turn them into, uh, into lawful interception bugs that they can use to go after their bad guys. And the people who discover these bugs, they don't just sell them to the nice governments. They sell them to autocratic regimes around the world. Ethiopia has become the world's first turnkey surveillance state where for a very small spend, and despite the fact that they have virtually no internal ICT capacity, they've become a supercharged surveillance superpower who um, use Western technology to spy on everyone in the country in a way that allows them to maintain more social stability than they would get otherwise, despite the fact that they have an extremely corrupt government that has hoarded the, the lion's share of uh, the money and resources in the country for the cronies of the, the ruling elites. And so um, these uh, these these malware uh, attacks that rely on bugs have caused copyright and surveillance to converge in the same place. Any business model that prohibits you from knowing how your device works is uh, uh, salubrious for spies who also don't want you to know how your device works. And so they become the same kind of company. Um, now, this uh, points up a really important point about neoliberalism and surveillance. There's a kind of cliche that in Europe, we worry about corporations spying on us, especially American corporations. And in America, they worry about government spying on us, that we trust our governments and they trust their companies, or at least they think that they can make a trade with their companies. And if they don't like the way the company spies, then they can just opt out of the surveillance. But that's not quite right. The only reason surveillance works is because of the public-private uh, uh, surveillance partnership. Um, the only way that the NSA is able to spy on everyone is because they can go to the internet giants and they can say, give us all your data. Usually in secret, they can do this. If it wasn't for the fact that Facebook and Google and Apple and all the other companies had so thoughtfully tidied all of our information into a neat little package that the NSA and GCHQ and other spy agencies could harvest, um, the spy agencies wouldn't be able to get all this information. You know, the Stasi, the East German secret police, had one snitch for every 50 people in the GDR. 
And the NSA, they use one agent for every 10,000 people in the world they're surveilling. It's a 5,000 fold increase in efficiency. And they did that by only while only quadrupling their budget, the surveillance budget in America since the Cold War. And the way that they got there is because the IT companies have made spying so very, very efficient. Now, if you trust the state to regulate corporate behavior, you have to understand that when the state depends on corporations to do their spying for them, that you can never rely on the state to stop corporations from spying. And you have to, and if you believe that corporations will behave honorably and that they will never give your information to the government, you have to understand that once you allow corporations to gather all this data, that they'll be that they will use it to spy on uh, all of us, that they will go to them and, and insist that they give it over in secret and spy on all of us. So there is no way that you can stop public surveillance without stop, stopping private surveillance. And there is no way that you can stop private surveillance without ending public surveillance. We have to work on all of these things. And that is, in fact, the bad news, that it's impossible for us to give students more agency without at the same time working on reducing the perception of schools as a special form of factory. And it's impossible to give students more privacy without ending this crazy cronyistic business model where we surveil our kids in the name of keeping them safe from naughtiness. And you can't solve the privacy question without working out the copyright question. All of these things are entangled. They're all part of the same problem. And you can't solve one without unpicking all the rest of them. That's bad news, right? Because if you just care about one, you can't just put your work there. But the good news is that every time we chip away at one of these things, we open a space for attacking all the rest of them. That each bit of the problem we solve redounds through all the other parts. And that is good news. It's good news that all of our problems have a common root because it means that they'll have a common solution. So that's my talk, trying to tie together neoliberalism and copyright and privacy and the idea of schools as businesses um, and the public-private partnership and surveillance. And I hope that the combination of all of those things is something that you'll find useful. Anyway, thank you very much for this, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the course. Bye.